Hi, my name is Michael Wu. I'm a, a partner uh, at the Singer Lewak, which is an accounting firm. I think the reason I'm here is I support a lot of Chinese company you know, coming here, open subsidiaries and uh, investment and, and all that stuff. Uh, I just uh, I just came back from Beijing about I, my plane just landed about three hours ago, and uh, I heard a lot of things. If, if you follow the news, the the U.S. team, right, actually is in Beijing now, and they're going to talk about this so-called trade war. Uh, I think it's just about to start. You know, in next couple of hours. It's going to be Thursday and Friday, and Xi Jinping is going to attend that meeting as well. So, so we're, we're going to talk about this so-called trade war. Uh, although I think from the U.S. perspective, we don't really look at it as a trade war. We look at it as a negotiation, right? We, we got to bring down the, the, the trade difference, right? You know, 500 billion versus 125 billion. This is 375 billion dollar difference. The U.S. is trying to bring it down, but anyway, yeah. You know, hopefully, our moderator will show okay. up. I will just thank you, Michael. Welcome back to San Francisco. Three hours ago, wow, hardworking guy. So next one, can you introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Bill Wang. Uh, thank you for staying late for the panel. So I'm from Three Sixty. Uh, if you now know Three Sixty, we are one of the leading technology companies in China. We just went up public in China with over fifty billion dollar market cap. So the company has the worst portfolio from number one browser in China, number one security solutions, number two search engine, while also a leading publisher of online games. Also, we also have one top three mobile streaming app called Huajiu. We also have a micro lending business called Three City Financials. Wow, 360很有名啊. <laughs> Can you introduce yourself? Good afternoon, everybody. Um, <clears throat> it's good to be here. I think we're in a really interesting time. And anybody that really predicts anything is probably wrong. <laughs> and because we don't know what's going to happen, right? It's a very unpredictable. Because it's dark year or because what? <laughs> it's a very unpredictable situation. And um, so what we find is that um, there's big incentives to not have a trade dispute. And uh, there are big incentives to resolve it quickly. So those are two very positive things. Also, another thing that's going to happen is you're going to have to get creative and innovative because there's going to be different ways of doing things. And actually, this trade war will make manufacturers innovate. And the other thing that's going to happen is the whole idea of the uh, One Belt, One Road strategy is going to be very global. And so. So I think a lot of manufacturers are going to try new things, new regions, new global sourcing, and it's going to change a lot of manufacturing. So there's, there's some silver lining to all this. Another thing that could really happen that would be exciting is if they came up with some good ways of dealing with uh, intellectual property and trade secrets. And so I think there's existing uh, approaches that could be deployed widely where we maybe have uh, intellectual property in a company in America, and then we have a, a, a uh, development and sales and distribution company in China that's a woofy, and that they could focus on what we're best at. So for example, you know, you can't just take a technology and move it to China and make it work. So Uber was a technology they brought to China, and it failed, because it didn't have a Chinese root. Right, and so what you're faced with in that kind of situation is where something like Didi had a Chinese root and was very successful. So I think there's going to be good and bad, and we don't know what's going to happen next, and it could go on a very long time, or it could go for a short period of time. But what we will find is there's going to be innovative ways to source, supply, innovative ways to protect and reach collaborative management agreements with different entities that we haven't really seen work that way before. And so I think there's going to be a lot of good things that could potentially happen. It's just going to be really weird, and we're not going to know how fast or how slow it goes. You know, I waited all day for this, and then you started without me. So. <laughs> <clears throat> oh, 
you, you, you didn't miss much. You didn't miss much, Del. I, I, anytime I miss you speaking, Kyle, I miss something. I'm Del Christensen of the uh, Chief of Global Business Development for the Bay Area Council in, in San Francisco and the Silicon Valley. And uh, we have th three offices in China, so we work quite a bit in China. And I'm not sure where we left off. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, we did uh, prepare a few questions and listening to what Kyle was talking about. But um, I would like to ask, uh, I'll start with you, uh, Michael. Um, in the current climate of the, uh, of the tech war, or of the uh, tariff wars and the blustering that we're seeing and so forth, um, you just return from China, you do business in China often. Um, what are the, what's happening now? Are there any current repercussions of, of these conversations? Yeah, so I was in China for a week. Everybody's talking about GTE, right? I, I think everybody heard that this happened you know, about uh, a week ago or so, right? The uh, US government tell everybody stop selling goods or or uh, chips to uh, to the company. The company actually is one of the biggest cell phone uh, manufacturer in China. And last week, uh, Xi Jinping, president of China, actually came out uh, in a, a technology conference, and he mentioned, uh, you know, basically call for all the technology company in China focus on innovation. They gotta catch up with you know, U.S. And right after that speech, Alibaba and Tencent came out and say, you know, those will be the uh, responsibility of a large company, you know, technology company like Alibaba and Tencent. And they, they're going to 100% you know, support that vision. Uh, so we'll, they look at this incident, right? They, at the beginning, everybody was scared. Everybody was shocked. And, but by now, it, it turned out to be... Uh, uh, a good thing for them. Right? They think it's a wake-up call. Everybody's supposed to focus on innovation. They got to catch up. No longer just doing contract manufacturing and, and make money that way. That's interesting. And we see the article where 50% you know, of business from a major company is suddenly cut off or threatened, uh, I guess, to be cut off. And, uh, and sort of what are they doing? And, you know, it... I guess we're, or I'm asking this question because there, our topic is sort of the global uh, environment of uh, innovation and also this uh, technological ecosystem, which we talk a lot about here in Silicon Valley. But we're really talking about the, 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 the products that we're making now are made of components that are built all over the world, right? And so you need partnerships in order to just uh, to manufacture what you're working on. Um, and that takes us into sort of like the, the philosophy of what Bill, we talked last night a little bit about, uh, sort of the, the differences in philosophy, sort of the consumer approach uh, versus the mission approach, or you had a couple of other sure. labels for that. Yeah, well, innovation is to open to anyone, to any region, but the way of innovation is quite different in China and the States. For example, when I look at the Chinese companies, they are more pragmatic that more consumer experience oriented. You know, take example, uh, Huawei and Xiaomi didn't invent smartphones, but today they are leading suppliers of smartphones, uh, not only in China, but also in other regions. So, um, so WeChat, everyone uses WeChat today. They have almost one billion monthly app users. So WeChat didn't invent a uh, mobile messaging app but they're able to combine mobile messaging with uh, people's daily life. In China, you can use WeChat to socialize with people through moment. Also, you can buy things, like you can buy movie tickets, order food delivery, or pay utility bills through WeChat. So that's quite innovative. For my company, 360, uh, we disrupted the security software business by making free to free to everyone. In the past, you pay like 30, 40 bucks to buy a security software, but we offer free, better software. So that reason we got over 90%, over 96% market share in China. Well, in the States, companies more like a dream big, uh, 
like for, for example, Facebook, their mission is to make the world connected, more connected and open. So they, they use drones to be internet to people in remote areas. They invest billions of dollars in VR to make people can socialize in the virtual world. The other good example is uh, Google. You know, Google encourages people to think big. Larry Page said, uh, if we hire the right people and we dream big, we'll get there. So that's how Google made some speculative bias many years ago. They invest in self-driving technology. Uh, they invest in Google Map to map the whole world street by street. That's unthinkable years ago, but now it became reality. So I see the way on innovation very different. But as Michael said, now China realized China need more investment into the fundamental technology development. So I see the road getting kind of crossed these days. Yeah. I think it's going to be an interesting time in China because it will have to innovate. And there's some big barriers to innovate. The number one is nobody has time. Nobody has time. Right, you think about it, if you spend 70 hours at your job, and when are you gonna innovate, right? So, and then you have like another bonus project, especially the people at Baidu, where they have to work in the, on the side job for the company. Well, so there's I think also there'll be some so much money change. sort of laying on the ground to yeah, pick but, up, why innovate when you can well, yeah. get rich by not innovating? Yeah, but people will be pressed to change, and there's gonna be, I think that our countries have a natural collaboration. And we're very similar. And so sometimes people might look at that and say, oh, you're too close to each other. Are you enemies or are you collaborators? But I think there's a real complementary path we can go down. And um, as we get through some of these disruptions, I think we'll find it. Disruption, you mean the so-called trade war? Well, I really don't know what it is, OK? <laughs> well, it's just a lot of activities and signals. I would classify it as an unstable regulatory and political yeah. environment. And so if you can find a way to add stability and certainty, people will invest. But well, I don't know if I want to invest you know, a lot of money in something that could be changed or taken away for political reason. But, right? but Trump government is looking at it, right? So we buy from China $500 billion a year. China yeah, buy from US 125, right? So, yeah. so they just try to balance this, right? And, you know, the Treasury um, uh, Secretary say you just kind of bring down the number by 100 billion dollars, and you, you, the the tariff, all that stuff, is just a tool, right? I don't know. We'll you know, the, you just, let me give you an example. If you look at the chi China tariff, item by item, there are 600 pages. We, if we, we import a car into the U.S., the tariff is 2.5%. You import a car to China, is 25%. Plus, there's a whole bunch of other taxes and the fees. So if you buy a Mercedes-Benz, $100,000 here, there, it's $300,000 yeah, to begin it's, with. You're talking about a game, right? And so I never play cards with Chinese students <laughs> because they always win. <laughs> And uh, I might be more aggressive, and, uh, and they will go, wait for you. They will wait till the right time and play the cards. But they and also so don't have a lot should, of money. We should just, observe this situation sure. and, uh, and not play a game that we might not win. Absolutely. If you want to play a game, you, you know, we're not going to win. I don't want to play a game. But yeah. also, that's, that's right. uh, also, you know, we're talking about... so. You know, there's the tariffs and that sort of thing. But when you come out and you say you cannot sell this product to that country anymore from an American country, I think there's a line that's kind of being crossed there a little bit. Um, but to this idea of, you know, maybe pushing somebody into a corner where they have to innovate and they be that becomes the, the new culture to innovate more and, and more and more. Uh, when I was first going to China and we were talking about the ecosystem of Silicon Valley, we would say, if you go into Facebook and you go into these companies, there's all these signs on the wall that say, don't be afraid to fail, fail a lot, things like that. These were unbelievable concepts in, in China when I, we were first talking about it. And those are the things that have to be embraced. So what you're saying is, think of the new idea and go for it. That's a, the next cultural leap. And uh, the council's been in China for 10 years, and in that time, we've seen, you know, gone from manufacturing to consumer to innovation. 
um, and also now globalization. So they've, in China, they're moving through these cultural changes pretty fast uh, for so many people and with, with such a long history. Uh, Bill, did you, I, I'm sorry, I thought you wanted to say no, something no, about that. <clears throat> okay. I think that, you know, there's this guy named Mr. T. I don't know if you remember him or not, but Mr. T used to say, I predict pain. <laughs> and I think we're going to go through a tough time. Mm -hmm. It may be short, it may be long, but we'll all learn from it, and some new things will come out stronger. Yeah. Um, we have been giving a sign that, uh, even as we sat down, we had three minutes to speak. So, um, <laughs> why? <laughs> I think we have just to start. Yes, we just got started. And this is an interesting conversation. Um, and uh, so just closing quickly, what do you think the next year? What do you think of prediction for the next year? What would we see? For China? Yeah, for China, U.S. Well, uh, you bring up a good point, right? China, from the government, <laughs> they know they need to innovate, right? You know, all the big companies know. But my, my question you know, for the panel maybe, would be, do they have that environment like we have here, right? You say, you know, fail a lot, right? You, you know, entrepreneur, you come out, you do something, you fail. And second time around, you have a new idea. You still got to get some money. Right? There's a lot of VC here who will support you, right? So, so this innovation needs a lot of different you know, elements, right? One of it is all these VC support, you know, do we have that or do they have that in China, mm -hmm. right, to support that type of uh, innovation? Yeah. Yeah, well, I'm optimist. Uh, I think U.S. China so depend on each other. And I think the relationship between China and U.S. will be stronger and better in the future. Uh, our president uh, is a businessman. For businessmen, you want to do deals. You want to make great deals for your country, for yourself. I don't think Trump is stupid to start a war to ruin U.S. jobs. That's his key focus for job creation. So I think there will be no war. There will only be more collaboration between China and U.S. That's my prediction. Yeah, I, I don't really know what's going to happen, but I do think it will be change, opportunity for change. And whenever things get reset, you can, you can really make a difference. You know, it really could be good for both countries. I think we really need to collaborate. I think pessimists don't ever make progress. You know? I, I would say, um, you know, the council's perspective and, and my perspective has always been you can't keep these two markets away from each other. They've been doing business for 200 years, you know. The market in China has never offered more opportunity for American companies and for entrepreneurs to go and do pilots and to start and that sort of thing. And so, you know, I would suspect that there's going to be an overwhelming sort of outcry that people want to get to the, mar get to the markets, learn from each other, and develop these products. There's going to be a lot of pressure. Um, and as the rule of law continues to develop, you know, into a way that the Americans can understand in China and so forth, it's gonna, there's an opportunity there to just continue to open up and add pressure to these, these thoughts about uh, tariffs. So uh, I think there's gonna be a, an uprising uh, from the business and entrepreneurial community about like, let's stop this. And we will see the result of the war, <laughs> the trade war in a couple of days. They're meeting uh, Thursday and Friday, so it's a couple hours from now that Xi Jinping is going to be in the meeting too. So. It seems that half of the people at this uh, event are going to be on the plane with the U.S. going to China. <laughs> either Half the people either came in from China today or they're on their way to China uh, tomorrow, so there's no way to keep them apart. So I want to thank my panelists for uh, their patience uh, and uh, I apologize for my tardiness and also for giving us some really clear ideas and thoughts in such a short period of time. And thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you.